That's an awesome hymn, isn't it? Uh, it just encourages us of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for our children this morning and the, the music, the instrument, the organ, the trumpet, the piano to glorify you this morning. Now, Lord, as we sit at the feet of your precious word, just clear our minds of all the earthly challenges that we have and take hold of our heart to soften the hardness that we have um, through our daily lives. Guide us, Lord Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. Today, we've been, uh, well, last several Sundays, we're looking at miracles. And miracles are something that we pray for on a daily basis, uh, earthly miracles, uh, earthly stuff, and also the main part of that is our physical um, healing. And of course, right now, we have two men of our congregation at the, at the doors of death. Um, Del Prangy, um, the last two months, he's taken a turn for the worse, and uh, now he's at a hospice and getting ready to um, go into paradise. And we thank you for many of you who are able to, to call Ross and Suzanne or visit down. It's just a matter of days. And then another gentleman, John Lawson, um, he's been fighting colon cancer. He worships at the 1045 service. Um, he now is at, um, just within a day or a couple days too, as his body is starting to close down. He came with pneumonia a week ago, and he's at the Prescott Hospital in the ICU unit. And when we have those situations in our life, boy, do we beg and pray for miracles, don't we? Yeah, we pray for little miracles of earthly needs and financial or, or work or relationship. When it comes to physical, boy, do we beg, Lord, for healing. And not only selfishly, but we'll see today, um, what's the purpose of seeking miracles in our lives? And so here we go. We go, chapter 9 is kind of interesting. It's a whole chapter is on this, this healing and it's, um, and it's also like almost like a court case. <laughs> Not the one that we're having in Phoenix the last you know, several months or what seems like it. But this one is about the man's journey of his faith from the beginning until now. And it's interesting. Here's a man blind. And what a question, the disciples. They're becoming more theologians day by day as they're with Jesus, asking the deep questions as you do in Bible class and your devotional time. And so they just throw it out there to Jesus. <laughs> Who sinned here? Somebody has sinned here because this man is not, has not a perfect body. Powerful. How many times have we thought that in our lives when we're going through a difficult time, we're thinking, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong to be in this situation? Now, granted, yeah, many times in our suffering, we have caused it. You know, something that we said or didn't say or something that we did. Uh, we cause a lot of our miseries as well. But we also know that suffering is a universal, is the universal sin. Is that we cause sin and we are victims of sin. Someone else could have caused something and a domino effect has caused a change in our life as well. It's all over. It all, and the question that we love to ask is why? Why, Lord, why the suffering? And we use that a lot. And really, we try to forget why we were created. Right from the beginning, we were created to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Not a forced relationship. <laughs> I saw the other day in a restaurant, or was it was a Cracker Barrel yesterday, they had, they had these puppies, um, you know, stuffed animals with the, the, the beds as well there. You know, it's just perfect. I think, boy, that would be perfect sometimes just to have that instead of three dogs that would drive my life crazy with hair everywhere, getting me up in the morning, want to eat all the time, and got to clean up their mess, and on and on and on. But would we want just a stuffed child, a stuffed husband, or maybe we might want a stuffed husband sometimes. Maybe, but it, when it comes to it, it's about this unconditional love. This unconditional love is that someone can love us and not love us. And when someone loves us, it's the greatest joy in the world. When someone chooses not to love us, it's the worst building in the world. And that was the truth of good and evil. There was a the door there. God goes, if you don't like my living conditions, there's the tree, there's the door. And we talked that many times before as growing up, there's the door. If you don't want to follow the rules of this house, there's a reason why we have tough love so we can have peace within the household. And so, so the question is not why. We know why. 
It's because of our selfish nature and everybody else, 7 billion people on this world and before us, that have created the suffering that we go through from day to day. And even our bodies are not perfect. And so Jesus says, neither. It's, we're not going to blame one individual for a blindness. All right? We're not going to go there. It's sin. It's devil. And we have been a part of the devil's plan, and we have choose not to love. And so this is where we are today in our lives. So, the question we should ask is how can God be glorified? When we pray for a miracle, what is your purpose of praying that miracle? What is our purpose? And here God is sharing us in chapter 9 is that the purpose of praying for miracles is that God can be glorified. That God can be a part and be glorified. When we've been praying for John Lawson for the last four years that he's, or five years he's been with us. We've been praying for a miracle. He's, he's in his early 60s, and boy, he has a lot of friends back in the Mesa Gilbert area that do not, are not a part of a Christian church. In fact, this is his first Christian church when he moved up here. And friends like you encourage him, and he and his family have now been faithful at 1045 every single time, even in his suffering. He comes, and he has received that hope. And yesterday, you know, he confessed that Jesus is a Savior. He celebrates that Jesus has forgiven his sins, and he wants to thank this congregation in his pain, what he's going through. But this man who's blind now to see, and watch the journey with this. This is interesting, a great journey, is that first he calls Jesus the man. He's being questioned. You go in chapter 9, you kind of see what happens here is that, okay, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging, asking, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Verse 9, some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he's only, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. Verse 10, all right, now here comes the journey. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus, all right? That's, that's his relationship. This man you called Jesus made me some mud and put on my eyes, and I can see. And verse 12 goes, where is this man? They ask him, I don't know. And then the Pharisee starts to investigate. Verse 13 goes, they brought to the Pharisees this man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was what, what day? <laughs> Seems like he only did it on Sabbath. <laughs> I don't know. To show people that he's above the Sabbath. The Sabbath is made for us. To rest and to worship and um, receive God's grace. And so these studies are made for us. The churches are made for us to receive. And thank you for coming to worship this morning. I always get a little nervous um, when the weather changes. And um, But you guys are so faithful. <laughs> Barbara was shoveling snow in Prescott yesterday. And she's here today. And so it's just amazing. All right. So here he goes. Therefore, the Pharisees also ask him, how has he received his sign? He put mud. He, he continues the same thing. You go to verse 17. Finally, they turn again to the blind man. What have you say about him? He was, it was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. Okay, he's being, you know, he's starting to confess his belief in the man who just opened his eyes. First, he's just a man. Now, he is a prophet. Powerful. And this is what any healing that we go through, any miracles that we go through, it's all about glorifying God, big or small. Any blessings that you have, the goal, the goal is definitely to glorify God. The blessings of Tim and John there today with their music, their blessing that God has given them a talent to use their instruments, and I think we should vote today to keep them here in Prescott Valley. All in favor say? Aye. Aye. Okay, I'm sorry guys, you're stuck here. Lock the doors. And go. But they're using their blessing. To glorify God. Our children use their blessing to glorify God. And they light the candles, come up here, shake everybody's hand down the aisle. Everybody wants to sit on the end of the aisle now. Because they want to, have to shake your hands. It's so cool. And so here he is. And so it, the journey continues. But the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent the, the man's parents. And this is, this is your son, they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he can now see? We know he is our son, the parents says. And we know that he was born blind. 
But how can he see now or who opened his eyes? We don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. And this is where we can confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Is this by the blessings in your lives? That's hard to witness. But it's not hard to witness when you're celebrating the blessing and other people are sharing the blessings too. You can simply say, God has given me this. What a blessing. And he used that blessing for others. We have a very difficult situation too now with the Weber family. As many of you know, Janet and Arnie Weber have a great granddaughter who was adapt, adopted four years ago here by their grandson. They're in Colorado. Maybe you know the story. This four-year-old now has a tumor in around her brain, and they cannot operate. It's totally fatal. Nobody survives. And so they know that death is at the door for this child. But they are praying for a miracle. Because the Webbers say, they, they share the story so often, is that one of their sons, this is a very spiritual family, you know the Weber family, it just, it's just amazing. But one of their sons is not a believer. And he loves Jubilee, this, this great niece. And as she faces the uncertainty of death, he's in tears and he wants to do all that he can. And the Webbers are asking, we, and we ask for a miracle all the way to the end until God's will is done. Either way, but they're praying that there's a miracle here for Jubilee so that their son, Jeff, life can be changed. And that's what's important for us is that no matter what happens to us physically, the more importantly is what happens to us spiritually. This man was physically blind, and at the end of the chapter, he says, let me just finish this. It goes at the end of chapter 9. Listen to what he says here. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. When he found him, he says, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe. And Jesus says, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. From man to prophet to Lord. And that's when every miracle points to us something physically that God is above all our physical challenges. And it shows us that What's more important, physical health or no health, is the spiritual health of our heart. This man will eventually have to suffer other pain, like we all do, all suffer through going to the road, the gate of death. But here, now he is saved, and he is going to an awesome place. Our sin is that we're spiritual blind. Our sin is that we're so focused on ourselves, or confident. But then when we start to panic, here comes the gospel of Jesus Christ comes. Not to make our physical life perfect, but to make our spiritual life perfect by dying on the cross for us and opening our hearts to Him, no matter what we go to. And then, as John and Dale and many of you during your crisis and sufferings have witnessed the gospel of Jesus Christ in your most difficult times. So yeah, our response is that any blessings or miracles, let us thank the Lord. And give him the credit and celebration that he has given us. Many of you have, have worked hard at God's will over the years. And, and there's been ups and downs. Ups and downs. Maybe you've been on boards and, and you had to hire people and fire people. And the money wasn't there over the years. But let me tell you what you've done this past Thursday. A young man, a freshman in high school now. Grew up at God's will. You know, daycare, preschool. And Thursday, he was baptized. He came back to God's world saying, this is my church. Even though he's never stepped through the doors on Sunday morning, he goes, this is my church, and I want to be baptized here. And I was telling him, Cole, this is only the beginning. Now you've been adopted in God's family. Now I want you to come. And I will challenge him and the God's world staff and those in the past will challenge him to come to worship with us. And his parents are, are interested as well. And so the hard work that you guys have done over the years, you have saved. God has used you to save another life and a family. And this family is connected abroad, and we just pray that God will use them to be the light in a dark world. Why do we seek for miracles? To glorify God, to give Him thanks and praise, and now be a witness for those who hear those joys. In Jesus' name.